Welcome to Journeys of the Mind on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about how democracy can fight back. Not so easy, because we all know democracy is under attack, not only in the U.S., but elsewhere. Our guest for this show is Carl Ackerman, who's an author, an academic, and a thinker, a philosopher, if you will. Welcome to the show, Carl. Well, let me, uh, let me begin by asking you, what is going on in Europe? Um, because, you know, uh, these days, um, Americans don't necessarily follow exactly what's going on. You know, you take a trip as a tourist, you might, you might read an article or two in the um, international, the world section of the newspaper, but we need, to, we need to know the gestalt of what's happening in terms of the way Europe and the countries in Europe are pointing. You know, I liken it to uh, the gathering storm by Churchill or the winds of war, uh, which was a movie series some years ago, uh, where we, we need to look and see what the, what the sea changes are. So, Carl, I ask you, what's going on in Europe? Well, let me begin with you know, some very good news for everyone. And that is, you know, the Labour Party in England just swept. And I mean by swept, you know, under Starmer, um, Sir, Sir Keir um, Rodney Starmer just cleaned up um, in England. And so that's, you know, that's a very progressive sign. I mean, that party um, probably is more aligned with Bernie Sanders and uh, Kamala Harris and um, uh, Joe Biden. So, you know, it, it, that's a very um, good sign. And I, I'm not talking about a good sign in terms of, you know, conservative versus liberal versus sort of liberal left, which they are. Um, but a good sign in terms of turning back from the right wing philosophy. And even, you know, um, uh, Emmanuel Macron, um, you know, he took a gamble and, you know, he took a very calculated gamble that if he held open elections, he would still remain in power and that there would be built a centrist left coalition, which should be the aim of all parliamentary democracies in this particular time, whether that's in Germany, in uh, Spain, in Portugal, in England, or in France. So one of the solutions um, to sort of the right wing movement, and I'm going to talk about that in just one second, um, is to, you know, form these um, coalitions. And of course, with NATO, um, you know, adding, um, you know, uh, uh, Sweden and Norway, uh, you know, this is that, you know, and we'll give uh, Joe Biden credit for this, you know, uh, the West is even stronger um, now than it's been in the past. So, you know, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic. And, you know, you have like people like uh, Victor Orban, Victor Orban in, um, in Hungary. And what you have to understand about him, much like you understand about Vladimir Putin, these guys are, are both products of the Soviet system and the Marxist-Leninist system. So small d Democrats, they never were. Um, both joined sort of anti-CP groups, Communist Party groups, when they were um, students or young, and you know Putin in Leningrad and Arbon in Hungary, um, uh, and um, I'm, I'm not sure it was Budapest or what, but you know the point is that um, they both were more liberally tainted, um, but both when they consolidated power reverted to what they knew from their youth. And um, because um, the example of Hungary is used so often, what that means is <clears throat> that once they're elected and they get the majority rule, they try to put into um, power um, anti-press stuff, um, declarations of uh, emergencies, um, and, uh, and they've been successful or semi-successful um, in, in doing that. And then, um, you know, the ultimate uh, power is to become the oligarch. Um, and Putin has succeeded, um, Orbán has not, um, and uh, Viktor Orbán. And so, um, you know, it, it's it's examples like these that you have to um, fight against. And of course, the major issue here is <clears throat> how do you do that? And you do that by forming coalitions. And um, you try to prevent uh, strong men who identify only with themselves. They rarely use the word we. They often talk about how I am fighting for you um, and you identify them that way, like um, Donald Trump in the United States, um, because he's also, um, uh, you know, very dangerous. And, you know, uh, Kamala Harris is doing exactly the right thing. She's forming the coalitions. She's um, uh, reaching out to a lot of young people 
She's getting uh, a lot of people involved. And if I were here and coined first on uh, Think Tech Hawaii, you know, our FDR had a had a new deal, but I think the Biden Harris platform should be uh, giving every American a fair deal, and she should continue with the um, with the uh, Biden doctrine, which is not to get not to put uh, troops on the ground anywhere, if at all possible. And of course, this is just the opposite of of um, basically the Hungarian and um, Russian president who want to put. Um, people on the ground, especially Putin, uh, in order to buffer up his own uh, political will, as, as, as it is. Yeah, you mentioned um, the French and the English, um, but there's a dynamic in Germany, in Spain, and in Italy. You want to talk about those countries a little bit? Yeah, I mean, you know, <clears throat> all three of those countries have far-right groups. Um, but they also have, as they do in France, and as they do well, more so in England, um, they have you know centrist parties, they have leftist parties, you know, and the job here is to prevent the far right or the far left from coming to power. And what I mean by far left is you know communist party return to you know sort of some sort of Soviet style um, empire. So those are the those are the key takeaways. I mean, you have to form this. Um, this coalition, and you have to emphasize that you're the party of freedom, and that's exactly um, what Kamala Harris is doing. She says we're the we're the party of freedom, freedom for women, you know, freedom of the press, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I think you know, one of the interesting things I think with right wing governments is that they initially and always go after the press, and you can see that in Hungary, and you can see what Putin is doing, even with you know mild reporters from, you know, reputable Western organizations. You know, they accuse them of um, being a spy and throw them in the gulag, you know, and, um, you know, there can't be any compromise here. And, um, you know, the fact that uh, the Trump administration is thinking about not delivering for the Ukraine that's fighting for democracy is uh, reprehensible. So no American, no American who thinks of democracy, who appreciates constitutional law, who um, believes in the system of law, should be voting for Donald Trump. There's, there's no question about it now. And I, I, that was not my position, you know, um, a year or two ago, or, um, it, but with this, with this current election, things have gotten um, um, pretty bad. And it's, you know, the Republican Party and those people like Lindsey Graham um, who have uh, you know kowtow to um, to Donald Trump are um, it, it's 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 not about uh, uh, well let me finish my sentence about that they, they have kowtowed to um, to Donald Trump are reprehensible and for Lindsey Graham it's even more reprehensible because of what Trump said about his good friend John McCain and um, if you look at the the Republican National Convention Jay um, um, in Milwaukee. Um, it was a lot about uh, the the strong man, the you know Trump. He's invincible because he was he was um, you know an assassination um, uh, failed against him. And of course, anyone who who, who resorts to political violence uh, should be locked up. Um, um, you know that's that's just not permissible in any form of democracy. But having said that, it was you know the introduction to that. Um, speech that Donald Trump gave um, day four of the convention um, with people like Hogan and things like this, that was really kind of surreal. I mean, these people were, you know, emphasizing sort of shouting wrestling slogans in order to um, compel a, uh, a speech by um, President um, Trump. And, you know, those who aid and abet um, Donald Trump um, should recognize that what they're doing is they're aiding and abetting um, uh, the forces of oligarchy, the forces of the anti-democratic spirit, and they're also abetting a, a, a convicted felon. And what I mean by convicted felon is that this man was tried by a jury of his peers. And you know anything about this notion on the on the right in our country that suggests that. Um, that this was anything but a fair trial is ridiculous. And, you know, the, people have to wake up. 
And, um, you know, again, a vote for Trump is a vote against American democracy. What's the echo on this? Is it, does it start this authoritarian movement? Does it start in Europe? Does it start here? Are they following what's happening in the U.S.? Are they, you know, um, are they emulating what's happening in the U.S., in Europe? Is there a resonance between the two places? I think there's a resonance between um, Trumpers and, and people in his spirit and the Hungarian model, um, as we saw when one of the hosts of Fox News went over there and interviewed people. But, you know, um, I, don't, I don't think it's so much, I think the, the model for the right is um, in Hungary. Um, not so much in, um, in, in Russia, um, but, you know, um, one has to understand also that the, both the Hungarians, I mean, one has to realize that it's only since, you know, 1989 to 1991 that um, there was not an Eastern uh, European situation in the former Soviet Union. And that, of course, went back to, you know, um, World War II. And, um, of course, you know, um, countries like uh, uh, the United Kingdom, uh, we go back to the 17th century. For English democracy, and we go back to the United States in the 18th century, and you know, of course, democracy um, keeps expanding. And of course, we—I I, I would make the case that we didn't have a full democracy until the late 60s, uh, when basically all people in the United States could vote. Um, and now uh, people are trying to uh, kind of uh, conserve this. And I—I I want to make a point clear here: this is not necessarily. An anti, uh, it's not anti, it's not anti-Republican or pro-Democrat. There are many uh, Republican leaders like the Bushes, uh, Mitch Romney, um, John McCain, who I greatly admire, and you know I voted Republican in my life. So I'm not, I'm, that's not what I'm saying. I just see, I see much as the Lincoln Project does, uh, a great disservice being done by uh, Donald Trump to the United States. And I think the intercha the interchange between the European um, the European community and um, um, the United States is that um, that most people um, in the European Union um, see the United States as a model for its democracy. And, um, and it's only um, Hungary and uh, Russia and China who see uh, North Korea also, who see this as, um, as you know, a, a different format and a more effective uh, way of of governing and just you know, Viktor Orban. Let me just let me just tell you about this guy. He you know he rose within the Communist Party. Um, as I said, he when he was a student, he became a little bit more leftist, and then he formed an, or his organized party. And then after that, I think his main objection was to remain in power. He did curb um, some social benefits in Hungary um, in order to uh, make the economy better, so it wasn't so um, bureaucratic. Um, and he did just do some good in terms of the um, Hungarian economy, but at the price of also now of um, sort of eliminating um, everyone who wants a free press. And as I said, trying to establish declarations of, uh, of national martial law. And when, when everyone talks about declarating national martial law, even in times of war, you know, I, I get a little scared. Well, you know, there, there, are, there are some things, as you were speaking, I was thinking of some of the common denominators you could find. And for example, how different is the migrant situation uh, in Europe from the border situation here? It's like, you know, we don't, uh, people don't want migrants uh, and immigrants. They, uh, and this, this is, um, you know, back in the day, we had this too, this, this kind of isolationism, the, this kind of rampant nationalism, and there's a parallel. The other parallel is that um, people are confused by government. They're confused by what is happening. Um, it is overwhelming to them. And part of that is the media, which has a way of confusing you, even if they think they're doing a good job, they're often just confusing you. Um, and then there's social media, which does everything it can to confuse you. And so you have um, you know, a different kind of electorate these days. If you looked at the electorate um, uh, in the uh, 19th century, they, <clears throat> they sat around um, the, uh, the fireplace and discussed things together, man to man, woman to woman, and, and they tested their political views that way. And it was, uh, it was um, you know, a, a, an engagement, uh, a, a personal involvement in the conversation. 
But we don't have that anymore. A lot of people do never talk about politics with their, their communities. They just listen. They're wallflowers. Uh, and they become complacent. And the, and the only source of information are these media who talk in a bubble and uh, political uh, social media, which tries to convince them about mm, a lot of things that aren't true. So what we have is, a, and, and, and schools, and you're familiar with this, schools that don't teach them about um, invidious comparison, don't teach them about the value of immigrants, don't teach them about civics and government. And I was watching a, a little piece with Jay Leno, and, and this is you know from a few years ago, where he was asking people on the street, you know, he called it jaywalking, um, people on the street, these really simple questions about how government is formed um, to make fun of the fact that they didn't know. And, and, and it's got to be worse today, a few years after the jaywalking series that he did, um, because people have no clue. You know, one of the things that I used to do in the elevator where you have a, uh, you know, a group of people who is um, not able to get away from you, I, I would ask them questions like Jay Leno. And I, and I found that it was the same thing. They had no idea. Three branches of government, who the vice president is, who the secretary of state is, um, you know, all, a million things like that. And they do not know because they do not read and understand. They get their, what do you want to call it, community information from unreliable sources starting early in life. So you say it's nice that everybody can vote, but you know some people really aren't qualified to vote and they take us all in the wrong direction. And those are the people that Trump speaks to. The same thing in Europe. Those are the people that you know, would-be autocrats uh, speak to. And you know, everybody says, oh, well, we'll fix the schools. It'll be better. How long does it take to fix the schools? How long does it take to fix a generation that, that has been made ignorant? that has no clue what the real issues are, has no clue about the things that, are, that you need to know to actually exercise your voting franchise. And, and I feel that there's a, there's a common denominator between Europe and other places and the US that makes government and the participation of citizens in government much less effective than it might have been 100, 150 years ago, even 20 years ago. Um, so I'm, I'm concerned about that because I don't see any, mm, any sea changes that would correct it. You're optimistic about, you know, the fact that people will do the right thing. But uh, are, you, are you optimistic in the face of, a, of an electorate that has no clue? Um, there were some interviews with people from, uh, uh, from the Trump crowds who were talking about um, that we don't have a democracy because they were confusing a republic with a democracy. And of course, those sort of things, as you rightly point out, should be pointed out in schools. I'm glad that we have an American history requirement. Um, the schools where I taught at, um, uh, at Iolani School and at Punahou School, um, were, we had very good um, American history teachers who not only taught kids to uh, study and learn American history, uh, um, people like Russell Motter, um, people like Bonnie Tramore, um, both of whom, you know, are schooled in history, love history, and they're like, they, you know, that's the way I think of myself as sort of a, you know, a, a, an aging history teacher that, that likes to um, just focus on, on um, democracy and things like that, keeping politics out of the classroom and um, things like this. And so, you know, um, in, in some cases, you know, um, the conservative movement has talked about, you know, um, not being too politically correct about history by talking about the great things that happened. And of course, you know, American history, when we started with our constitution, of course, we had in the constitution sort of uh, accounting people who were slaves. And, and you know, the, the United States has evolved greatly, but I mean, you have, to, you have to point these sort of things out and you do so, but, and also talk about the great strides that people made. You know, I, my, one of my heroes is still George Washington. One of my heroes is still Thomas Jefferson. They owned slaves, indeed. They were awful and abhorrent uh, for this, but I understand what they were trying to do in their time. You know, the old Profiles of Courage uh, uh, book by John F. Kennedy. You know, um, people are, are complicated. And um, of course, slavery is, is, is a horrible mark on the, on the United States. And of course, um, 
African Americans in the in the United States are some some of the people who should be given most credit because of the su the suffering that they've had to go through in order to achieve what they've achieved um, over the course of our history. And of course, this is true of many immigrant groups and Native Americans and Asians and things like this. But you know, I think we have a pretty darn good country now, and um, we just have to avoid the the strongmen like Donald Trump. But I want to go to one of your comments. You know. Donald Trump complains about the border and putting the big wall up. But I mean, if you go back to the 19th century and realize that we kind of stole that territory from Mexico <laughs> in the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and stuff, and you know, you realize that the names of, of places in California are Los Angeles, San Francisco, Santa Barbara. I mean, you have to understand that you know, there's a there's a great um, uh, Hispanic Latin presence in, um, all over the Southwest, and um, you don't want to stir up sort of anti, um, anti any kind of people by calling them rapists and all sorts of things. And that's what he's doing. You know what? He's successful. You know, he's got a lot, a lot of Latinos on his team. And it's, it's really remarkable. And this goes, if I may, to uh, Elon Musk's uh, announcement yesterday that he was going to give Trump. He had decided to give, he's the richest man in the world, they say. He's going to give Trump $45 million every month between now and the election. That's five times 45 million. That's over $200 million. And then you get to the question of whether with that kind of money, Trump can, or any autocrat, or would-be autocrat, can, can win an election. Um, and the, the notion in, in America is that money equals votes. It hasn't always been that way, but it certainly is that way now. If you gave me 200 and some odd million dollars in a period of four or five months, um, I could do a lot. I could buy a lot of TV ads and I could I could tell people black is white and white is black. I could tell the Latinos who should recognize their their ancestry and their value to the country and the value of their compatriots coming across the border or trying. Um, you could convince them to vote for Trump, who is just the opposite. And social media, you know, it doesn't take all that much money to, to just flood social media. This is, um, in the case of uh, Elon Musk, it's, it's, it's money that you can see that he announced. But there's a lot of dark money out there. Um, I saw a piece the other day, Carl, um, by um, a guy named Whitehead, Sheldon Whitehead. Uh, Whitehead uh, wants to, he's a senator, he's a lawyer, constitutional lawyer, and he speaks on a regular basis to reform the Supreme Court. And he explains the biggest problem in America, the biggest problem for democracy is dark money. It comes from you know not where. Um, Stephen Miller runs a lot of it. And it's just really tragic that he should do that. He's, a, he's the child of Holocaust victims. It's amazing. Um, and, and what happens is this dark money gets into the TV ads, uh, the social media, uh, campaigns for voter suppression and litigation all over the country. And uh, Sheldon Whitehead made it clear that there's a huge campaign going on right now under Trump and the MAGAs um, to get that money and to use that money to make black into white and white into black and confuse people and get them to vote against their own interests and against democracy. So it's, it's really remarkable how everyone thinks that if you just tell them the story, they'll go and vote properly. But that's simply not true um, for the people who are the victims of dark money. Your thoughts? You know, um, I, I, I understand this. And you, you began with the story about Elon Musk. And, you know, Elon Musk is doing a great disservice to the United States. Um, by supporting um, Donald Trump. And it's it's not, you know, I rarely in my um, uh, 69 years have, um, you know, come um, across this negative about a, um, a, a politician who has received the, the will of his party. But this is a different type of a guy. This is a dangerous guy. And I think, you know, I think what's interesting about Donald Trump is, as I was watching the Republican convention, you know, he could go and retire and spent a lot of good time with his family and relatives and, you know, work on his businesses and, you know, just enjoy life. But his, his, his natural instincts is to tell stories and often lies about other people. And, um, 
and they're often vitriolic. And um, my feeling is by um, Elon Musk doing this, he's enabling a man who has been who is a convicted felon, and also who is 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 a molester of women. And and so, you know, you have to you have to be a little bit more. Um, decisive and thoughtful about where you're going to put your money and things like this. So, you know, he's aiding and abetting uh, Donald Trump and what Donald Trump stands for. And this is, this is no good. I'm not saying that everyone who votes for Donald Trump is, is an enemy or, you know, they, they may be very, very good people. And, um, but uh, what Donald Trump stands for is this oligarchic um, Hungarian Russian type of framework. And that's not who we are as the, as the United States of America. We are a democratic country. We follow the rule of law. We accept our uh, election losses. And this is a man who has shown that he will not accept election loss and try to subvert democracy. So going back to your really immediate point about um, the similarities between Eastern Europe and, uh, and, uh, and the oligarchic framework, with Hungary and Russia in particular, China, uh, but mostly, um, well, China includes is included here. Um, the Russians and the hung, um, uh, Hungarians, especially the Hungarians, are, are really against um, you know immigrants, the immigrants coming into Europe, um, and um, also trying to support other um, um, Hungarians in other countries, including the Ukraine, <laughs> that have moved to different countries and giving them um, special things, much like you know the Anschluss by um, Adolf Hitler. You know, in other words, you want to you want to take care of the good German folk. But, um, you know, there, this anti-immigrant, um, anti-border um, crossing um, uh, makes sense to a lot of Americans and a lot of people in Hungary because they see people coming in, maybe not legally, not following the rules. And um, we are a nation of laws. And this is where I would agree with people. I would say people must come in to the United States legally and we should have you know, enough of a border presence, not a wall necessarily, but a border presence to keep people out who are not legally um, um, in tune to get, you know, American citizenship. But, and here's the big but, if you drive up Highway 1 in California and you go to a place like Oxnard and you look at the fields and you see people working out in the hot sun, and then you go to Safeway and you eat salad, vegetables, and most particularly grapes. Who's doing that work? That work is being done by people who have emigrated to the United States recently, and sometimes illegal immigrants, people who have not come in legally, with the support of the big farm owners. So, you know, this is a complicated question, but there could be no complication about the fact that people must come in to the United States legally, and they must get, you know, the proper uh, uh, documents and become American citizens. This is true of every country. But the massive attack on the uh, southern U.S. border by Donald Trump and the massive attack uh, by Viktor Orban uh, in terms of Hungary, um, you know, are both examples of sort of criticizing the other, you know, and criticizing the people who... Um, don't really fit in with society. And of course, Jay, you and I have known since we were children um, that, you know, in Nazi Germany, of course, that was the Ashkenazi or the Sephardic Jew, much less gypsies and other people, but primarily um, Hitler's version of, in Mein Kampf, of, the, of his notion of the, of the Jewish threat. Hitler did not start um, <clears throat> with the Holocaust. Um, Hitler was thinking of other things, and just trying to get powerful. And then he settled on with the advice of his friends, uh, the notion of anti-Semitism, violent anti-Semitism, and the Holocaust in the thought that it would enhance his power and people would come along with him. And he was right. It did enhance his power and you make a scapegoat. We all know this, you know, all the readings about the history of Europe, um, you know, over the past uh, 100 years, when these European countries, um, out of, I mean, thinking of Angela Merkel, um, out, of a, out of a sense of, um, a sense of acceptance, a sense of um, trying to be as humanly good as they could, they allowed people to come in. 
Uh, and some countries were better at it than others. Um, and so what you had is um, you had some countries that managed, to use that word loosely, the uh, immigrants, the migrants that came in, and other countries that really didn't manage them very well at all. And then after a time, the people in those countries, um, especially the right-wing people, that grew up around the issue of the unmanaged uh, migrants, and they made it into a political issue. Let me, let me offer this thought at this point to say that it's all about management. Had these countries, you know, back, what, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, managed the migrants and said, you want to come in, we want to know who you are, we want to know what you're going to be doing. Uh, we want to meet with you. We want to be satisfied that you're not doing anything that undermines our civil society. And uh, we're going to keep on doing that until we're satisfied. Then, you know, it could not have, it could not have been uh, a scapegoat issue for autocrats or would-be autocrats. You've got to know who they are and you've got to manage them. And to some extent, Europe, some of the European countries have. Some of them haven't. In the US, we have done a really atrocious job at managing people in the last, what, 20, 30 years. Um, back when, in, you know, in the days of Ellis Island, they, they kept the record. They know who was coming in. And, and the economy you know, forced you to mostly um, you know, be involved. Uh, but, but more recently, um, the economy doesn't do that and the government doesn't do that. I remember um, a question came up about the number of undocumented um, you know, aliens in the United States, the number of people who are immigrants of one kind or another, with or without documents. And um, the question was, how many? Who are they? Have a list? And the answer is the Immigration Service did not have a list. The federal government did not have a list. They didn't know who was here and under what circumstances. How can you manage them that way? So they get, you know, some of them get in trouble. Uh, they, they take government benefits, um, maybe when it costs us too much. And they make room for Trump to scapegoat them. It's really sad that with all the technology we have, and we are the leading country for database technology. I follow that. Um, we, we can't seem to identify who belongs here, who doesn't belong here, the people who are in one status or another. Give me a number. Give me a list. We don't have it. And so as a result, um, you know, they become targets um, for the likes of Trump, who use them as a scapegoat um, political maneuver. But let me go, let me go uh, forward a little bit. So we talked here today about um, you know, what you can do. You can, um, you can form a movement. You can get together. You can teach people and all that. But we're not. We're, we're simply not. And uh, you know, I don't know what's going to happen with uh, Kamala Harris, whether she can garner real support, people who back her and continue to back her, people who follow the movement she's trying to create about certain policy points, you know, about Ukraine, for example, that's a hard one. Um, about, you know, dealing with the Middle East, that's another hard one. About dealing with these major issues like immigration, like um, education, uh, like the economy. I mean, you've got to have a movement that comes together. Trump, with all his machinations, has his Project 25, which is a, a kind of movement, movement uh, headed toward destruction. I'm waiting to see Kamala Harris come up with Project 25 for the Democrats. Um, I don't know if that, that can happen, is going to happen, but I think it should happen. So that's one thing that has to happen for the preservation of democracy. Um, but I have a, a bunch of other things, and I'll throw them out at you, and, and you, can, you can comment on them. One is that we have to get people... The media has to get people to consume news properly. And that means the media has to clean up its act. And I don't mean to undermine the First Amendment, but we have to get people to consume legitimate, true news. Second of all, <clears throat> the people who care about should be making news. They should be speaking out 
about the, the value of democracy, everybody. Um, and that means they have to read, write, and speak in the media. And they, they're not really doing that. You only have a few people in the media. Um, next is they have to teach, like, like you do. Um, they have to be a teacher. They have to teach everybody they know and in every way they can to teach and to manage those who do teach so that we all get together on this um, movement for the re-education of, of America. And they have to, of, of course, vote, but they should vote for a platform. Sheldon Whitehead the other day said, you have to find out whether your candidate who wants your vote um, is, is, uh, is, is, is for or against dark money. And if he says nothing, you have to assume the worst because our politicians are all <clears throat> involved in money. Look at Mitch McConnell, my goodness gracious. There's a program about him on YouTube. It's amazing what he has done about money. And on money, individuals have to make contributions. We live in a, a sort of national fundraiser moment where there are races going on all over the country. And every day, I don't know about you, but every day I get dozens and dozens and dozens of emails asking me to contribute to some race in a faraway place. Now, I'm not saying I'm going to or I should contribute to all those races, but I think you have to consider what you want to do. Um, saying no, I'm not going to contribute to anything about anybody and to be complacent and be a wallflower. Um, that's really not acceptable. We're all involved in this. So it's the movement, the speaking, the teaching, voting for a platform rather than a personality and making contributions, dealing with the money. Complacency under no circumstances is acceptable. Now, I gave you my whole shot there. What are your thoughts, Carl? To finish, Jay, by taking on those thoughts. So first of all, you know, um, education and civics is paramount. You know, kids should learn about the Constitution. And that way, when you go and talk to people in the streets of New York, like Jay Leno did, um, I'm assuming it was New York, um, that people will come up with, with better answers because they'll, they'll have had good US history teachers. Um, in terms of acquiring news, I think you have to turn the channel and you have to go from conservative news like Fox, you've got to go to CNN, you've got to go to MSNBC. You have to watch a, a, you know, a variety of news. By the way, on the recent, on uh, Joe Biden, um, uh, you know, eventually um, being removed um, by himself, I mean, he came to his own conclusions about the race. Um, that whole coverage uh, was best done on Fox, actually. Um, they were giving, you know, people equal opportunities, seeing that there are many things in the, and CNN um, was, you know, going only or mostly to um, people who were pro dumping Biden. And they, would get, they were getting a lot of uh, anti Biden when this was always a, you know, significant minority. And, you know, I, I just I, I thought to myself, wow, you know, um, Fox is doing a you know, a, you know, pretty good job. And I think that there are people who are journalists that are trying to do their, um, uh, you know, best, you know, conservative journalists and liberal journalists. Um, you know, um, I think that they're all trying to do their best. And there are good people on Fox and there are good people on CNN. And um, oh, you know, wow, are... Carl, I'm going to have to disagree with you. There are people on Fox that lie every day. They continue well, to lie. I, I can't see them as journalists at all. Well, there have been people and there's there, I'm forgetting his name now, um, but he's much like Chris Wallace. And I've always, you know, Chris Wallace worked for for um, for Fox for a long time. And he was always very good, asked President Trump very tough questions when others at Fox were not. But um, to sort of complete this. Uh, um, session in terms of what we were talking about, Jay, is, you know, I, I think there has to be a lot of um, um, institutional change. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, I, ironically, I think that once um, Donald Trump has disappeared from the political framework, um, a lot of things hopefully will um, go back to normal. <laughs> and um, the other part of this is, you know, I, I for me, one of the critical things is for the Republican Party to become more critical of its own. And um, the nice thing about the uh, Democratic Party was that it was critical of its own and the chief person in the party, the president. And then now given it may have been motivated by people trying to get reelected in their districts, um, but people were very 
both kind to him and, and critical of him. And um, I think that's, that's the way to go. And I think you do have people like Lynn Cheney um, and Mitt Romney and people who are no longer part of that party who could be you know, reassu reass re reassumed into that party or re re basically create a new party. And the other problem here is that you have to have people who have a set of values um, I think the key thing is that every American should say, do we believe in the Constitution? And I would suspect that many people do. What does that mean? And that means, you know, separation of powers and all these things. I think that we have to be careful about arbitrarily changing our institutions. I would not be for um, adding people to the Supreme Court right now. Um, and I think it's a fair say that when you get, get a conservative president, a conservative president can can point conservative justices, even though some of those justices on the Supreme Court now I happen to vehemently disagree with. But still, I, I think going forward that the key to the game is um, um, and the key to sort of preserving our constitutional democracy is is being able to work within the political framework and trying to always remain, um, you know, uh, consistent with a set of morals. And that's why I think that President Biden has done two things. Um, and I'll end here, and because I think that he's a big promoter of democracy and constitutionalism. He's kind of a, you know, I, I think of him as like an old history teacher too, um, in, in that he promotes, you know, things like a fair deal for all Americans, he and uh, Kamala Harris. And he promotes not getting Americans killed on the ground. You know, when we go into a conflict, we better be darn sure what we're doing it for because we don't want Americans dying. And with those two doctrines, I think he's done a good job to preserve democracy, to save American lives, and to promote um, economic um, a focus. But if someone says, you know, that they're gonna um, unite America, and they talk about themselves only um, with glowing metaphors, um, and that, you know, I took a bullet for you guys, those are things that aren't really helpful in the long run. Um, you know, I mean, you know, um, that old slogan about, you know, um, ask not what your country could do, uh, ask not what um, um, your country could do for you, but what you could do for your country by JFK. I think that's what people have to think about. And I think that they have to think about it in terms of protecting constitutionalism, protecting democracy, um, remaining vigilant about people who are trying to smear other people on the basis of their sexual orientation or their or their race and things like this and um, allow all individuals in america um, to get a fair deal and to be able to progress in the united states well the reality is if you talk to one of the trumpers they would disagree with everything you've said and furthermore they would tell you that joe biden has not been a good president that Joe Biden has been the worst president in the history of the United States, that Joe Biden ought to be indicted and convicted and jailed or executed. That's what these people think, and they are completely mm, committed to those positions. So what we have is uh, arguably a kind of civil war, an ideological civil war. Um, and although uh, I would agree with what you said, a lot of people would, the question is, uh, a, whether uh, the Trumpers, the, the MAGAs would ever vote for those things or anyone outside of Trump. And B, if, um, if Trump loses, uh, what will happen? Um, he had one insurrection. He's uh, very Akamai about insurrections now. And he may call for and get violence. It's interesting how you mentioned earlier in this program, Carl, about... <clears throat> about how nobody, nobody thinks of um, the fact that he's been tried and convicted. It's been forgotten. It's the news cycle. The media simply doesn't cover it anymore. It's old news. And Trump is counting on that. Autocrats count on that. So arguably, we have, we have a, a, a tremendous difference of opinion, a divisive ideological process in the country, and for that matter, in Europe. I remember one guy was a, a journalist for the Irish Times, and somebody asked him, you know, how do you feel about America? And he said, America, I pity America. 
And I think he was really on, 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 on the right note there because we have lost so much. We have lost the togetherness that we used to have. We have lost the greatest generation. Um, and I don't know if we can regain it. And I'll tell you more in November um, or in January, depending on the vote and what Trump does after the vote. But let me only say, Carl, I think this is appropriate for both you and me. The one great option, and neither of us are Christian nationalists, but the one great option left for both of us after all this discussion is to pray. And I am praying that this country does the right thing. How about you? I agree. I think prayer is always uh, wonderful. But I, in the, within the general context of our conversation is, I want to end by saying, if you vote for Donald Trump, you're not my enemy. Um, and, you know, you can have different opinions in the United States, and I will respect them. <clears throat> what I, what I'm a, a little, um, what I have a deep set question about is how people can vote for someone who is, you know, a convicted felon. How, some, how people can vote for someone who says really awful things about our fellow Americans and how one can vote for someone who clearly was instrumental in trying to throw, overthrow American democracy. And it's not the average American who's voting for Trump that I blame for this. The, key, the people I blame the most are the Lindsey Grahams of the world, the Republican Party um, stalwarts, who are good people um, in many cases, but here have, have failed, have failed um, their country, um, they failed and their moral um, code. And I think I think that's the, that's the thing that really upsets me the most. And you know, and you know the reason I think that Mitt Romney did what he did, going back to your uh, comment is that you know he believes in a higher power and he could not uh, stomach going against his code of morality. And, and Lynn Cheney did too. And you know, I'm a, a centrist Democrat and I disagree with them as, as Republicans in some ways. But you know what? I thoroughly respect them. Um, but I, I think the people in the Republican Party are who are trying to safeguard their political position by reverting to supportive statements of people who have clearly done wrong things. That's not that doesn't sit well with me. And I know it doesn't sit well with you. OK, we're out of time. We're going to have to leave it there. Suffice to say. We are in the middle of an inflection point, a big sea change in this country and elsewhere. Thank you so much to our guest, Carl Ackerman. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Thanks for watching. Aloha. Aloha.